Hey everyone, Mecha here. Saw this funny idea for a tier list on Reddit where someone ranked how much a character got buffed or nerfed between Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. And since I've been playing a fair bit of Tellius lately, I thought it would be a good time to do it. If I still sound like I'm recovering from COVID, there's probably a good reason for that. Let's get into things. Ike is kind of mid in FE9. My favorite way to describe FE9 Ike is to not specify you're talking about him, but say there's this lord in this game and he's unmounted, locks the swords. The supports are good, but everything else about him is pretty bad. He has a horse effective weapon, but <clears throat> it's not that useful. And he promotes way too late. And then near the end of the game, he does get this really powerful one or two range sword that destroys everything, but it's just way too late. And for most of the game, he doesn't really do a whole lot. I mean, everyone probably thinks you're talking about Roy when you're saying that, but a lot of it applies to Ike too. Almost everything, in fact. And I think it honestly is arguable that Ike, if he's better than Roy, it is not that much. So, and most people agree that Roy is pretty bad, whereas Ike usually has a couple of defenders. Now, Radiant Dawn Ike, no one thinks he's mid. Everyone thinks he's pretty awesome. Even within the Grow Mercenaries, which are known to be fairly good, he still has the best combination of HP, uh, strength, defense, and speed out of anyone except maybe Shinon. There is no one who really matches like any of his stats and then still doesn't lose to him in a lot in another one by a really big amount until you get like, I don't know, Yanaf and Oki. He's just really, really powerful. And that is normal Ike. Transverse Ike is even more ridiculous, where he gets to patch up his I wouldn't say borderline speed, but his speed is not the best thing about him, but with transfers it's good enough to double pretty much everything. And now his strength is good enough to two-shot anything, and he just murderizes everything. And he gets the Ragnell before part four even starts. Uh, he promotes in part 4 and he becomes probably your best combat unit. Honestly, better than the Laguz Royals in part 4, just because he has 1 or 2 range, whereas the Royals do not. He is just almost limitlessly good. And all he requires is like one of your three Paragons in part 4, just to grow a little bit faster. He doesn't even need it or anything. He's just so good. So, possibly the biggest improvement, maybe? Question mark? I would use his FE10 portrait here. Uh, my other tiers that I made in the reply to those threats used the FE10 portraits uh, for units that were better than FE10, but I found it just got really confusing really fast. So I'm just using the FE9 ones. Um, Boyd. FE9 Boyd, I quite like. People meme a little bit on unmounted units in FE9, and correctly so, because the mounted units are just. In a vacuum, being mounted is way better than being unmounted. Being mounted means you have more mobility, and you can carry other people around with you, and you can move after attacking, and you can probably use the Night Ward as well. There's just too many advantages to list. But unmounted units, if they're good at combat, are still very much worth having in FE9, especially because as good as mounted units are, they tend not to be capable of destroying just about everything. In fact, almost all of them have some kind of issue, whether it's in the short or the long term. Uh, some of them don't, which is why we're going to rank them really high. But generally, I find that it's worth to have like a couple of good unmounted units in FE9 that you can carry with your mounted units to get into combat. And there's a couple of units that have the offense and or the bulk to make that worth it. And one of them is Boyd. Boyd has really good offense in FE9. Unfortunately, FE10, he's kind of the same, except he lacks the relative high amount of availability. Whoa, what is that word? Availability that he has in FE9. And on top of that, his speed is so bad that it takes him like forever to start doubling. His strength is still good, although I think it's still worse than like Katriz, for example, which is a little bit embarrassing. And he doesn't have the greatest bulk. Like, he, has, he just has a lot of stats that need patching up that are not his HP or his strength. And even those aren't so spectacular that they make up for it. He's just kind of fine. Again, transfers help a lot with this. You can get a speed transfer if you're a little bit lucky. I think you need like a speed wing to make it worth. Uh, obviously, you can get a strength transfer and an HP transfer. And all that really helps to shore up Boyd's strong spots. Can make him cap early in FE10 and then you can bonus experience him to give him more stats because, you know, if you cap stats, you give him some bonus experience, they still gain three stats, and those are usually stats that need the help a little bit more. So that helps a bit. That makes him better. But Boyd is very much a training project in both games, and while in FE9, training projects like him are pretty easy to use, especially for units that join so early and are able to just get XP naturally. In FE10, you can't really use many units like Boyd. I think this is a phrase I'm going to be using a bit more often. Uh, in this video, particularly talking about FE9, but FE10 as well. It's okay if you're a unit that needs some resources to get going. In fact, that's usually interesting, and it doesn't disqualify you from being good. But it, you can't really use infinite units like that. It's still better to not use resources. 
And the amount of resources FE10 Boyk needs in hard mode, they tend to be an amount where he becomes incompatible with some other units that are also, you know, fun to use slash good training projects. So that kind of hurts. FE9 Boyk, though, is one of the better units in the game. Definitely the probably the best amount of units in that game. If I, I might be wrong about that, well, that's what he feels like. Uh, so I would say he got a nerf, because I would say he's like one of the better units in FE9 and one of the, like, he's kind of mid in FE10. So we'll say he's a small nerf. Uh, Titania, hands down the best unit you have early on in FE9 and only gets surpassed by units that need more resources than her. Probably solely responsible for most of the bonus experience you have. So in a fun way, using your Jagan is allowing you to use more Ests and units like that, which I always found really cute. Even the most diehard group mode haters that I know Love using Titania just because she gives you bonus experience to work with. And generally the FP9 cast early on feels a bit bad. No one is really good at combat. Uh, generally people tend to maybe get like a blessed Ike or a blessed Oscar. Or maybe a blessed Boyd. And then everyone else just kind of feels eh. But no one thinks Titania feels bad. Everyone thinks Titania feels really good to use in FP9. Of course FP10 Titania is still good. But she hits a snag for FP10 that all multi units hit. Which is that there's just a lot of direct and indirect nerfs to horse units. Uh, indoor maps slow you down, ledges slow you down, their stat caps are a little bit lower. Just in general, being a paladin is just less good in Radiant Dawn. Titania managed to escape the biggest problems by not having that many indoor maps to go through, but there are a couple. Uh, I guess she has a skill capacity as well, I guess that's something else to mention. Uh, she still has Axis, that's the best weapon type to have. She doesn't really need her, I don't even remember if she gets Sword or Lances after promotion, honestly. I don't know why I brought it up. Uh, soul is pretty nice in FE10, just a crit that also heals you is super nice. Uh, FE9 soul is kind of whatever. I don't really think I'm discussing masteries a whole lot, but I thought I'd mention it at least once. Um, she's brilliant in FE9, of course. Her long-term strength is not high enough to one out everything, but at least her bulk tends to be good enough to survive things. She's have the Night Ward to make her speed good, like she easily caps speed and then in Path of Radiance, so doubling is never a problem for her. Uh, even after the early game is over and you're already start promoting, I find that Titania is still like perfectly viable in FE9. But there are units that do surpass her. If you compare like a... Especially if you compare like a base Titania to like a level 20 promoted Oscar, and Oscar looks a lot better than Titania. Of course, Titania is not going to be base level like that, uh, but it does show that at some point she's no longer a league of her own. That, that time does end at some point, but even if she's still a little bit worse than a trained Oscar, that's still like really, really good. So, Titania and FE9, uh, I'm going off of hard mode in both uh, FE9 and FE10, by the way, but for most of the part, these should carry over to any difficulty, really, but that's what I'm assuming in my head, because those are the modes I've played the most. So, Titania, really, really good in FE9, and then kind of good in FE10, like, huge strength, but needs a little bit of help with her speed, and her bulk isn't, like, quite as relatively good. You can get her killed if you overestimate her, which I tend to do all the time. So, with that in mind, I would say Tatina got a small nerf between FE9 and FE10. Um, I'm going to reserve the big nerfs for units that I actually used to be good and became bad, and that's not what happened to Tatina, obviously. Oscar, he is... Ugh, <laughs> he's so funny to me. Every time I play either game, I kind of change my opinion on him, because he needs help in both the strength and speed departments in order to one round in fe9 and honestly in fe10 too so he tends to be short of something almost always which sucks that's the forward experience no one likes that but at the same time it's undeniable that he is helpful in both games especially fe9 where he's around for most of the game where you have very little choice on who to deploy and you can't escape the reality that a mounted unit like that is very helpful. He has a very fast support with Ike, which makes them both nearly invincible. He has a support with Kieran that makes them both really good. Earth support is very helpful in both games. Uh, but especially FE9, where you have a support list to adhere to. Whereas in FE10, you kind of just get your Earth support whoever you, you want it with. It's still helpful, of course. And uh, I, I find that Oscar... I thought mine was getting RNG screwed in my last uh, playthrough, which was a Maniac mode, but the point still stands. It was still, like, so much short on one running things. Only after I gave him, like, a bazillion stat boosters um, for money reasons, then he became, like, good. But he's just not. And this is... I constantly checked his averages. He was, like, maybe one point behind on everything. Which could make a big difference, but I knew it didn't. Even on fixed growth, Oscar will just fail to one run things. But his durability is fine. Being a multi-unit is very helpful. Being able to carry someone like Boyd over is still super helpful and everything. I would say he's, like, a, he's still, like, an A-tier unit in Path of Radiance. But, God, sometimes using him really sucks uh but actually 10 oscar has like all those problems but then he also got hit with all the horse nerfs that i mentioned for titania he's no longer 
as available, relatively speaking. Uh, he still is lacking in honestly every stat that you want. Like none of Oscar's bulk and strength and speed are particularly outstanding. He does one on stages at base. That's like his only enemy type that he's really good against. Everything else he feels to double. Uh, I think he doesn't need to two shot most enemy types. So already all you have is the horse, and sometimes the horse is a detriment. So he goes from like being really good to kind of he's still helpful. So I'm still gonna hit him with a small nerf, I think. Uh, but he definitely got nerfed bigger time than Titania. I just want to reserve the big nerf for a couple of other units that I think got hit harder. Uh, Reese, I think, is going to be our, our first about the same. Because in both games, he really just is a very fragile, supportive unit that you don't want to use for anything except healing and other status stack utility or just stack utility in general. And in the cases where you can use light magic, which is after motion FE9 and just a base in FE10, he has some meaty chip damage, I guess. But for the most part, he just dies to a stiff breeze and he heals people. And that's pretty helpful, but it doesn't change a whole lot. You can argue about whether staff utility is more helpful in FE9 and FE10. I don't think it's very good in either. <clears throat> if if I had to pick a game where he's better, it probably is FE9. Because in that game, for one, you don't have the concoctions from Radiant Dawn. So the healing is a higher demand. Uh, you also only have like one other healer in Mist. Whereas I feel like in Radiant Dawn... I guess you have the same amount of healers there, but the concoctions are just a big uh, competition in there. Like being able to buy a, an item that heals 20, is just, or vulnerabilities heal 20, the concoctions heal 30, which is even better. And on top of that, this is just, I guess FE10 is a bit harder in the sense that the enemies hit a bit harder, but I just feel like in FE9, he comes in handy a little bit more often, but not enough to where I think he belongs in the same tier as a small improve or a small nerf. So I'm going to throw in about the same because all he really is in both games is a heal bot and it doesn't really feel like that function is much worse or better in either game. Shidan is super interesting in FE9, probably the most intriguing unit design ever made where he starts off as a sniper Jagan that occasionally just makes you pay a Jagan tax and gets a crit and then just refuses to elaborate and leaves and then he comes back and he's more like an S kind of unit that a lot of people don't even bother re-recruiting. Uh, and he's just, he's pretty bad when he returns, but he's still so fun to use. And in FE10, he's just, like, he's like Ike level stats, but he's a bow user instead, which when he first joins is still fine because there's a lot of demand for a two range unit that can help out. Like, your other two range options are like fragile mages like Soren or Rolf <laughs> or uh, someone with a short axe or a short spear, which is like, it's all fine, but sometimes you want a guy that doubles and has a chance to crit or maybe adept something. And Shinon can be that guy. He is good. He's got really good stats. And if you can work around the fact that he doesn't have one range, which usually you can, he's pretty good in three prologue, in three dash one. And even beyond that, there's like a couple spots where he can be really nice. As part three moves on and the game goes from interesting, like small skill conflicts, which is big open fields with a lot of enemies to route. His stats stand out less. You have units that can just sweep with one to range more and more often, and Shinon becomes kind of obsolete in my opinion. He's still good. Like if you just look at his stats, he's fine. But clearly, the utility is is lost after that point. Uh, only until he gets a double bow, and then when you get the double bow, he has one to three range. One to three range actually when he promotes, which is sick. And then he starts one running things again, and the game is almost over. But it's a pretty good final impression. So a lot of people really like reading down Shinon. I think it's obvious that. Raiding Dawn Shinon is a big improvement on the FE9 incarnation. I prefer the FE9 one because I think it's funnier and I always get a little bit depressed when I try to use Shinon in like late part 3, early part 4 and I just I just don't have a reason to really do a lot with him because he can't do anything on enemy phase. So I always have to shield this guy with really good stats and it makes me feel stupid. But no denying that Raiding Dawn Shinon is statistically the winner here. Gatri, uh, FE9. I'm actually kind of enjoying Gatri in my Maniac Mode Iron Man. I wasn't expecting a guy with this much defense and this little offense to be good, but it turns out Maniac Mode enemies hit kind of hard in FE9, and so having a big human shield here is kind of nice. And I do stand by the point I made about Boyd, where having a unmother unit with uh, some kind of utility, generally I was thinking offensive utility, but defensive utility can be just as good. It's just nice, even if he's not mounted, as long as you have enough mounted units to support your unmounted units, they can still be very helpful. 
And in that sense, I think Gatri is very nice. That said, in hard mode, there is much less def uh, demand for this than uh, Maniac mode. So I have to dock a couple points of that from FE9 Gatri. He is a training project. He does come with an awful lot of need for speed. Uh, you kind of need to glue the Night Ward to his armor and level him up every time with it, or else he's not going to be able to double ever. In fact, mine still isn't doubling, but again, I'll blame that on Maniac mode. I'll cut him some slack. If you tank a tree, ate the Night Ward, as I like to say, and now he has really good growth in HP, strength, speed, defense, and kind of good bases in there. Not as good as I would hope sometimes. If you don't have transfers on Gatri, then he still needs a fair bit of help to get to the point where he's self-sufficiently doubling, especially. Without the Master Crown, he just doesn't have the caps in a tier 2 to start doubling yet, I don't believe. And just in general, I find that Gatri doesn't have as much utility because he just doesn't have the mobility that other units have. And then the bulk, the bulk is good. But usually you can have a unit like Titania or Oscar or I get by with the bulk they have. Even though it's less, it still doesn't impact them as much as Gatri's less, lesser offense impacts them. And also Gatri, uh, I think there's like a chance he gets crit by Thunder Mage whenever he fights them. But that's a problem he shares with a couple of other units. It's just that how, that's how mine died in Iron Man, so I'm biased there. The point is, I think Gatri still has some issues in Rainy Dawn. He can work those out. He can work out, I guess we could say, the kinks in his armor and become a really competent, self-sufficient like unit that just one-rounds everything and never dies. Late part 3, early part 4, I think, is reasonable for FE10 Gatri to reach, which is better than he generally ever gets in, uh, in FE9. So I think we can put him in, in small improve to break that tier in a little bit. Next up is Soren. FE9 Soren is another one of those units that needs quite a bit of help, both to the mobility department as well as almost every other department that matters. Uh, Soren has great magic, but every other stat is just Garbo early on, offense and bulk. As time goes on, they both get better, but they never quite get to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm comfortable leaving Soren in range of a bunch of stuff. The only way to really cure it is to put Vantage on him and then like a 100% crit forge in like the Japanese moment. Japanese moments? Japanese version. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Which is what I can do in, in Japanese version, but uh, in English version, that is not an option. You can still make Soren's offense good enough on enemy phase uh, in combination with his, like, Ike support and just a robe and something. You can kind of make it fine, but it's never quite comfortable. That said, there are a lot of enemy types in FE9 that are just too bulky to one run, even with physical units. I know the name is the game is known for being like, oh, just have a mount unit to put out there with a one to range hand axe and just one on everything. But there's a lot of enemies that just won't fold to that, like enemy lagoos, enemy generals, even enemy paladins can be quite tough to one round if you have a paladin with kind of middling strength, like late game Titania and Oscar. So really, you just want someone with more offense like that. And Boyd is a good candidate for that, but it can also be Soren and Liano doing that. And that's what they're best for, really. Uh, that said, it doesn't always pan out. You do need to put resources into it. So I don't think Soren's one of the best units in FE9, uh, but I do think he's like on par with or a little worse or a little better than Boyd, depending on your perspective. And his early game obviously sucks. Uh, Ileana works very similarly, by the way, but Soren has a bit more of Void thanks to his supports. FE10 Soren, dude, Mage has really got a big beat with the, with the nerf stick in FE10. They're just so behind on everything. Enemies have more res than they have in almost any other game. Uh, the mages are slower. They don't even have that much magic. Uh, the tomes are just generally nerfed. Uh, just almost everything you can think of is just kind of bad about them. There's no real reason to have a dedicated mage in Rainy Dawn unless you want to have dedicated mage in Rainy Dawn, which is a good enough reason to do it, but it just doesn't feel great in that game. So Soren definitely got nerfed. I don't know if it's small time or big time. Uh, I kind of want to reserve big nerf for something else, but at the same time, yeah. I'll put him in, in... It's a big nerf. <laughs> he was good before, and honestly, in Rainy Dawn, he's kind of on the bad side. I do think he's significantly worse in Rainy Dawn than the other units here. And I do think... I mean, he was already worse than them in Path of Radiance, but the gap is bigger. I'm going to put him in big nerf for now. I'm going to say he's a big nerf boy. Um, Mia, on the other hand, is a massive improvement. FE9 Mia has to be like the earliest, most disappointing unit that you get in that game, because everyone else who joins early on in the Girl Mercenaries at least is kind of good. And Mia just has very little purpose to her. Uh, her strength is so low that she struggles to like four hit KO enemies. And yeah, she doubles everything, but that still means she's two rounding at best, and even that can be a struggle, like I said. Uh, she has an 8 Vantage, which in FE9 is 100% activated, and you can't like put it on someone else like you can in Radiant Dawn, so that's kind of cool. But until you get Wrath, you can't really make use of it in any meaningful way. You can like 3-shot an enemy, you can like hit them, and then you face, you kill them off. But in FE9, enemies just have like healing AI, so it doesn't really do a whole lot for you. 
And beyond that, the inability to use like javelins or hand axes or any weapons with really good might is just going to hurt her a lot. Her long-term stats aren't good enough to keep up. And even if you, once you do get Wrath, she's not even the best candidate for it, which is very impressive considering she has innate vantage. It's quite insane. And V10 Mia, on the other hand, is one of my favorite units of all time. A very, very flexible unit. One of the few units in hard mode who doubles right off the bat and really doubles enemy Swordmasters, which I think that's literally unmatched within the Grim Mercenaries until the Hawks join. No one else reliably doubles to enemy Swordmasters. Uh, her only drawback is, of course, that she can get crit by them, and enemies in Radiant Dawn do have a fair bit of crit, so that's something you have to watch out for, but that's like the only reason to have her not engage Swordmasters. Other than that, she's literally the best at it. And on an enemy type, she's quite good too. Uh, she starts with the Wo Dao, which is not a very strong weapon, but soon she can graduate into like a Crit Forge, which is one of the best uses of forging money and resources in general in that game. And you can give her like a Depth, maybe. She still has an advantage, which is like, it's good enough where it's useful for her, but there's no real reason to put it on anyone else because no one really wants to use the capacity for advantage, which only works like a percentage of the time. So Mia's is free to take advantage of that and combine advantage, adepts, and a crit forge and her innate crit to just occasionally just kill an enemy before it attacks her. And that's pretty cool. And then when she promotes, she gets Astra. She's just a really good foot unit. And even though she's not the, considered like the most effective in like investments, LTC, efficiency, whatever kind of unit, she is like pretty much the next best thing in that game. There's not many units that match her one range offense. It's unfortunate you cannot get like forged wind, wind edges in the same way you can get forged hand axes and javelins. But other than that, I don't know, there's plenty of one range enemies to fight with her. It's just a pretty good job. So I would say big improvements. She goes from one of the worst units in that game to honestly one of the better ones. Ileana is a big inspiration for this video. Um, just like Soren, she is hit by all kinds of incidental nerfs it seems to sages iliana isn't considered as good as soren in fe9 but when i did my tier list review with no it was typhoon carter that was his name uh he was like yeah they're pretty much the same unit almost in fe9 and you know he's played a lot more fe9 than, than i have he lacks the earth support that uh soren has with ike but iliana's stats aren't that different from soren's she's more focused on thunder magic but you know net speaking they if they use the same weapon they're gonna have roughly the same combat at base uh, like level 7 iliana and level 7 or soren are pretty much equivalent and in fe10 iliana is even worse than soren is because while soren at least just joins in the grim mercenaries with like nothing to his name you can just kind of make him good if you want to iliana joins from the grim from the dawn brigade she brings items from the dawn brigade which is good but i don't think that is something that we want to count for a unit's utility it is one of her best uses, is like carrying over some weapons from, from like good weapons, some good skills, some high value gems and stuff from an army that has too much money to an army that could use that money to do more with it. But I don't think that's really something she contributes in gameplay. It's more like an incident. Uh, I always find it kind of hard to discuss that kind of thing, but I'm not going to count it in her favor for this rating. And when you leave that out, you're left with a unit that is probably still tier one going into an army where everyone is tier two trying to get to tier three. That's very far behind. If her stats didn't reflect that, that'd be one thing. It's just like, okay, she just has a low level, but the, the stats are good enough to make up for it, but they're not. Their stats are like worse than the worst units in the Grim Mercenaries at that point. Even if you trained her in part one, she joins a little bit over leveled and then doesn't grow fast enough to uh, like stay ahead of the curve. If anything, she falls behind even faster than most other units. Uh, like imagine how like, how much someone like Nolan gets overshadowed by units joining in the Dawn Brigade by all, like, all these really overpowered like Nyla, Black Knight, uh, <clears throat> Toroneo, uh, Zihark, even Soth. All them existing makes every Dawn Brigade unit kind of worse and Ileana is unfortunately another victim of that. Uh, yeah, Ileana's not very good at combat. I'm gonna put her in big nerf. Mist is a weird case. I haven't had the pleasure of using her in like for all game long a whole lot i've tried a couple times but they are like once out of five times i want to say that i've played both games uh mist and fe9 and mist and fe10 honestly both are just really striving to get her to promotion and in both games it's a struggle because she joins low leveled uh in path of rage she joins under leveled and in fe10 she just kind of joins kind of on a leveled but not by as much but it's still quite a pain uh, a foot locked healer is like about as good as reese right but then her other traits are a little bit worse like reese is more magic and in radiant dawn he has like better chip damage uh the florite doesn't deal magical damage like its description says there was something funny about that about whether it was like a mistranslation or not um 
I, I just that occurred to me, but it's kind of outside of the scope of this video, but I do need to look into that because it was interesting. Um, I mean, healing, like I said before, it's I think it's more useful in Path of Radiance than in Radiant Dawn due to Fulnerase and Concoctions and the way they work. And uh, I think mispromotion in either case is, takes a bit too long to get to. At least in Path of Radiance, there's not that much competition for our Master Seal to get to Tier 2 because most units just want to level to level 21 and then promote, and it's not too hard to get them there with bonus experience being such a viable thing. Whereas in Radiant Dawn, you don't really get any, like, spare crowns that you can use on her. Uh, she needs a special Holy Crown. I forgot if you can use, like, a regular crown on her, but you don't really want to either way, so it's kind of a moot point. But if you want to use the special crown, you have to wait until Part 4, or you have to use the stupid bonus experience, and you, you really don't want to use only your bonus experience on Mist and Hard Mode, uh, just to get her to, to Valkyrie. That takes such a long time. So either way, a bit hard to justify, and then the, the, the payoff is you get a Paladin that can heal with bad combat stats, and I already said that having a horse in this game isn't necessarily good. In Path of Reigns, I would say getting the horse is a big upgrade. Having a mounted healer is just nice. In terms where you don't need to heal, you can just use it to like rescue drop or do something else. At least that is nice, and it's easier to get her there. So maybe she is a, a small nerf. I initially had her in about the same, but maybe she's actually a small nerf. Because uh, I don't think she's great in either game, but she's like finer-ish in, in, in Path of Reigns and Rain and Dawn. But yeah, we'll, we'll go with small nerf. Uh, Rolf has big, big issues in FE9. He joins... Like, I, was, I want to say he's like roughly the same problem as Mia, where he joins pretty early, but he can't really make use of that availability because for most of the time that he exists, everyone outclasses him. So just having to train him is a knock on him as far as youth rating goes. Again, I'm not here to knock on people who like doing that. Training units is a lot of fun, but I cannot pretend that training Rolf has the same implications as training Ike or... Uh, Boyd or Oscar or something like there is obviously a big gap in power there and in Path of Reigns you feel that really badly it's one of the few units in Path of Reigns that can get one rounded in his joining chapter which is a sad testament to his power or lack thereof in Radiant Dawn he's not great either but at least he's just under leveled and just a training project that can kind of get good-ish and like get really high strength if you really want him to there are some more prospects there whereas in FE9 it really is an uphill struggle for at least half the game just to get him to a passable level where he can do something. And even then, it's just you just get an archer that occasionally shoots stuff, but his, his stats aren't that much better than everyone else if they are at all. So, bad in Path of Radiance and slightly less bad in Radiant Dawn. So, I would say it's a small improvement, but yeah, it's, it's kind of splitting hairs, kind of. Uh, not even to have a lot of experience with, though, so I'll keep this section short. Uh, Marcia, she is considered one of the best units in Path of Radiance, and definitely the best example of how bonus experience can be used to make a good unit even better, or how it can make a unit that would normally be kind of middling to above average turn really, really good. Because in Path of Radiance, if there was no bonus experience, I would say that Titania is far and far away the best unit in the game. Whereas Marsha is just kind of a unit that you have to painfully train up. But because bonus experience exists, you can easily make Marsha a promoted Falcon Knight by... I think the usual time I do it is around Blood Runs Red, which is the chapter where you where the Black Knight comes out of the house. Like around the boat map saga, basically, is where Marsha can reasonably be promoted in hard mode. With still enough bonus experience to make like a couple of other training projects you're like You don't have to put everything into Marsha to do this. But if you f make her one of your focuses, just one of a couple... You can do that, and she'll just run away with the rest of the game. It's the most efficient way to do it, because you don't really have another flyer at that point to do that with. There's one other one that will join somewhat soon, and it's kind of contested. And you could, you could do it to both too, but it's most effective if you focus on a few units. Even without like an overly like focused approach, Marsha can still catch up to your other units and eventually promote on a normal schedule. That's not the most, the bestest, everest way to use her, but it still makes her look better. And the difference between putting like all your bonus experience in Marsha and the difference with doing a Rolf is that if you do it with Marsha, you gain a lot of new options with a, I want to say, I forgot if it's a 9 move or an 8 move flyer. I think it's a 9 move flyer that you didn't have before. Whereas with Rolf, you're probably not getting anything new out of that. So that makes Marsha really, really powerful. I do think, again, speaking to some Maniac experience, that Marsha is significantly worse in Maniac mode in Japanese, where bonus experience, you get less of it. And it also doesn't work as well when you have a lot of audience fighting for that smaller pool so um like someone like oscar needs more business experience in that game as well because the per combat experience is worse as well so it's just worse all around and also her strength is not as efficient in 
Maniac as it would be in Hard. So everything works against Marsha there, but for, for English Hard, Marsha is, I think, the best unit in the game uh, by a, a long shot. So we can only go down from here. Radiant Dawn, uh, this is when we get into the Crimean Royal Knights and their problems. Marcia is just not around for a lot of the game, and when she is around, she's fine, but she's in a group of units that are constrained to a couple of chapters, where like, Marcia is one of the better units there, like she's got useful things she can do thanks to her wings, but they're not so special that they elevate her to like some kind of special uh, above the pack thing, like she's one of a group of units doing things. And then when you finally merge her within your bigger army, her stats are likely going to be below the average of like the units you've actually trained. And so integrating her in your team requires more special uh, treatment. And at that point, she's no, unlike in Path of Rain, she's not the best target for it. She's still good. You still get returns out of training Marcia. Uh, a flyer that can do reasonably good combat in part four is nice. But the Falconites are not definitely, not as good as some of the other flyers you have at that point. So uh, I would say we're being hit with a nerf here. And honestly, I'd say we're getting hit with a pretty big nerf. Like going from the best unit to being... Uh, it's pretty big. I think if we if we put Soren and Liliana here, I think we have to put Marsha here, unfortunately. That said, she's still viable in Radiant Dawn. It's just that she came down from like the top spot in Path of Radiance. Next up, we got the Lagoos, Leith and Mordecai, or Leithy, as I try to call her now. And both of these are pretty interesting because mechanically, I would say Lagoos on the whole got buffed between FE9 and FE10. In FE9, they just have to kind of deal with their gauge as is. They transform at some point, and they don't transform at some point, and there's not a whole lot you can do to change that. Whereas in FE10, they got access to, like, Olivia Grass to transform more quickly. Lagoo Stones are a bit more common, whereas in FE9, they feel very rare. And I personally always feel like the Lagoo Stones just kind of should go on race, and most of the time, if you're not doing that, you could do that, but it's less optimal. It feels less good, uh, because racing just gets so much more value out of them. Uh, but every now and then, I do like to use Lagoo Stone on Mordecai. And... Um, Specifically, though, how whether your Lagoos is better or not depends on which one it is, because they're all wildly different. Uh, Lethe joins very early on, along with Mordecai, and she transforms right away. So if a map is very short, then she'll be transformed for the entire map, or the majority of it. If a map is, like, medium length, then she'll be, like, transformed for half of it, untransformed for half of it, and then it kind of loops around, where after that she would transform again and be able to help again. And I find that in most maps, Lethe spends... The most important turns, the early turns, transformed. And then later on, when it doesn't matter as much anymore, she transforms, there's not a whole lot she can do. She can still shove people uh, or like rescue drop someone, but there's not as much as she can do, but she can still be kind of helpful. So I don't find her transformation to be a big detriment. And in fact, I think having instant transformation in FE9 is the best thing you can have as a Lagoos. Uh, later on, you get the equivalent of the Wild Heart, the name escapes me for a moment, uh, the demi band from FE9, which you can put in a unit to transform them semi-permanently or permanently, uh, but with half bonuses, which is really good for Mordecai because he starts with the lower, like, I think the worst gauge in Path of Radiance. He starts completely untransformed. He has to wait until he gets to transform. So he gets a lot out of that. Uh, it joins around, it, you get it around the time you get more. Uh, in fact, it joins with him. So that can be a nice way to compensate for that because if you have to spend the early turn which is untransformed, Mordecai can smite people, and I like smite and all, it's useful, but it's not, like, super great, and if you don't have an exact plan on what you're going to do with that smite, it's going to be incidental moments where it's like, oh, I wish this unit was one toss closer, oh, I can smite, or something like that. These things happen, but not as much when you're not planning out your things, that makes smite and shove a bit less useful. But it's still nice that he can do something while he is untransformed. Uh, whereas in FE10, these units both join in part 2 for... Basically a single map, the map where you have Lucia as your main lord, and they're pretty helpful there. They're pieces of a puzzle, kind of like with Marsha and the Crimean Royal Knights. She's, uh, they're like good, but not great. And in order to get value out of them, you do need to use Olivia Grass and or like Lagoo Stones to make them useful there. And then you have them for two dash end game. They're like okay if you play the map out, if you want to defend all the points. If you're playing the map quickly, then they're not going to do anything significant except maybe shove Leanne, but that's still something, I guess. And then when they rejoin in part three, they're like they were before, but worse. Part of an army that is mostly outclassing them. Um, not immediately, but soon after you get the Hawks, who are generally better targets for Lagoos-based resources. And I don't just mean uh, Lagoos stones or Livy grass, but also just training their strike rank to make them permanently viable. It's something that works a lot better on units that can actually double 
and fly and kill stuff. So they have a lot of competition there. Uh, this is also something that hurts other Legos like uh, Ranulf, for example. Uh, but for Lethe and Mordecai, in both games, they're kind of short-term units. FE9, they definitely feel stronger early on compared to everyone else. Their stats are comparable to Titania's. And then later on, they fall off a little bit. They're still deployable and still usable, especially with the shelf utility, but just not as good, like not nearly as good. And if you tend, it feels like they're never as good as they were in Path of Radiance, even though mechanically Lagoos are a big improvement. So I find it really hard to rate them. Uh, if I average all these things out, then they would end up in about the same. Uh, I do kind of feel like they're better units in Path of Radiance than they are in Radiant Dawn, though. Like in, in Path of Radiance, I usually have them like around the A or B tier, like around as good as Ike is. Um, whereas in FE10, they're not even close to that. They're like FE, like, where did I, like C tier or D tier or something like kind of that. So honestly, I should put them in small nerf. But if someone puts them in about the same because they value these things differently, I wouldn't fight them over it. Not too hard anyway. Volk changes a lot. I don't know if it changes his ranking here. Because in Path of Radiance, he is basically just a thief and he just gets credit for getting you chests and doors. You pay him a little bit of money, but that money is so plentiful that it doesn't really meaningfully impact his rating at all. And there aren't that many chapters with chests, but the game doesn't have that many free chest keys. You can break down doors, uh, but usually opening it with bulk is about the same as breaking it down with an axe. So if he's just on a treasure room on his own, that's still something he can do as long as there's no enemies inside. He's not very good at fighting. You could train him to be okay at it, but it's really hard to make him good. Uh, knives cannot be forged. They don't have one to range. Both things that they do both get in Radiant Dawn, funnily enough. So he's probably one of your worst combat units no matter what you do, even if you do train him up. He's good growth and he has like pretty good stats, but the knife stats are just so bad they drag him down really horribly. <clears throat> the treasure you can get in Path of Radiance, there's not too much of it, but some of the treasure is so good. Now, you would probably, if you didn't have Folk or Soth around, you would probably use chest keys to get the best treasure. So what he really gets credit for is the, wor the, the best treasure that you can't get with free keys. I don't have it mapped out exactly which treasure you can get, uh, but I'm not going to give him full credit for, for example, the full guard or a stat booster you can get, because those you would probably get with chest keys. So with that out of the way, an FE10 focus is very different. There's no thief utility for them there at all, really, unless you count the one chest in the Tower of Guidance. Instead, uh, he's just a really strong tier three promote that you get when the game is almost over and you're just about to make your final chapter selection. Just like with like say Bastion and Laguz Royals, well not Laguz Royals specifically, but it's really hard to value the kind of unit that focus in FE10 because he gets no almost no free time to be useful except a little bit in the last chapter before endgame and then in endgame itself you have to dedicate a unit slot to bring him when you do bring him he is very good like i tried him out for the first time a couple playthroughs ago and i was pretty surprised at the numbers he was pulling he's not the best unit to fight generals with which is what i what you mostly want out of a unit bring to endgame because every other chapter is kind of solved with your free units but the the first chapter is where you can get the most value out of like a unit slot but I just don't find him as good as someone who will come to end game for free or someone who has like early game utility. So in that sense, I don't think he's very useful in that game. He just doesn't have a lot of time to be useful. Even if I ignore the unit slot thing, he's just not the best unit in end game. And he's also only around for the end game maps, which are all mostly rather short. Uh, you can play them out to be longer, but they generally won't be as long as um, the maps mostly throughout the game. So not a whole lot of maps, and arguably not even that great in those maps. He's alright. I think I would say he's like alright in that one. Whereas as a thief, he's also just alright. So strangely enough, even though he couldn't be more different between the two games, I don't. I find it really hard to pinpoint in what game he really is better. Uh, I think he's pretty easy to ignore for both games for the most part. If I had to pick a game where I think he's better, it would be FE9, but I'm going to put him in about the same. Because I feel like he does kind of... The same is kind of brings the same value in both games, even though he's vastly different to both. Uh, Kieran is likely going to end up in big nerf. He is one of my favorite units in Path of Radiance. I think when people think, or when I think of like good units in Path of Radiance, they're thinking of a mounted unit with good one to range, the ability to use axes, forged hand axes preferably, use the Night War to get a lot of speed level ups, use bonus experience to get a little bit of a head start if you need to, uh, and just kill a lot of things in one in one round. And it turns out that the paladin with the best strength and the ability to do that is Kieran. And even though he joins technically underleveled, his stats are pretty good for when he joins. 
Uh, if you promote Kirin instantly with the Master Seal, then he's like Titania's basis, basically. And he can get better than that so much faster. Even if you don't promote him, which you, you shouldn't promote him at base, if you're not playing 0% growth, then he is perfectly adequate for killing things. He doesn't like tank the entire chapter and one-art it or anything, but he's going to be about on par with Oscar, even if you've trained Oscar all the way through. And the ability to use axes instead of lances and then get lances on a promotion or bows if you really want to. Uh, using the Night Ward almost immediately, like a couple chapters in, to fix any speed issues he might have. He's just so easy to make good for so little, and he just murderizes almost everything. Uh, if you want to focus on Maniac mode for a moment, which my head is at right now, uh, my Kieran got horribly RNG screwed and is still somehow one of my most useful units, or, or one of my better units to deploy, just because of the amount of utility and the ability to weaken units for other units that I'm training. Uh, but normally he is one of the few Mazu units that can actually one round things, survive everything. Uh, just an all around stellar unit in Path of Radiance. And they nerfed my boy into the ground in Radiant Dawn. All the Paladin nerfs that I said before apply, but then he's also hardly available, unlike Titania and Oscar. He is in the Crimean Royal Knight army, so he's with Joffrey and Astrid and Marcia. And that army just doesn't have a lot of time to do things. They have their own little part where they do things, and Kieran's one of the best units in that part. Uh, but that part is effectively two to three chapters long before they merge with the Grand Army. And then in the Grand Army, he again doesn't stand out a whole lot. So uh, he needs bonus experience to catch up. He's not that good in part four. Uh, he doesn't have the caps to be a standout unit in endgame. Uh, he gets nerfed movement indoors. He's just not very good. So probably one of the bigger nerfs ever. I don't think Kieran is one of the best units in Path of Radiance compared to like the Flyers and the Tania, but he's like the next big tier. He's like A tier, basically. I think he's very good. And in Radiant Dawn, he's very unremarkable. So big nerf for him. Nephany, interesting case. Training project unit in both Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. More so in Path of Radiance, I think, but still to a big extent in Radiant Dawn. Path of Radiance, he joins extremely underleveled in the, in the Jill chapter. And raising her, <clears throat> it pretty much just mandates a bonus experience dump and the Night Ward whenever you can spare it, uh, which you don't have immediately, uh, but, you know, just like Kieran, it only takes a couple chapters before you get it. Uh, not that their speed needs a whole lot of help in the long term, but her bases are just so bad. A lot of people give her crap for having e rank lances. I never found that a big problem for Nephany specifically, because her best weapon is a forged Iron Lance, which you can use at, e at base with e rank lances. It does kind of suck that she gets, like, weighed down by Javelins. I don't know if you can use Javelins at base, but you barely want to anyway, because the accuracy is just so awful, unless you forge it. And really just Nephany needs a lot of kills set up for her. A lot of people will do it because soldiers are cool and they think Nephany is cute. And, you know, she is. And she turns out fine. Uh, one of the few units with innate wrath. So you can combine it with a vantage scroll and give her the vantage wrath combo. And if you can get Nephany to one KO with a crit, then you can probably get it to like around 80 to 90% crit rate in the English version. Uh, Japanese version doesn't have the crit bonus for Halberd Years, but the English version does. And then you can sort of be cooking. I still think that build comes with a couple of risks. Um, you don't really have high crit 1-2 ranged weapons unless you force a javelin with crit, and even then it's not going to have as much crit as a killer lance. Her might might not be high enough to one round some bulkier enemies, or one to kill them with a crit. And if you're fighting a bunch of enemies, then having like 80-90% crit is good, but it's not enough to be reliable. So it has a lot of like asterisks to it that I think make that build a little worse than what it can feel like in theory, but it is very cool. Uh, it just takes a lot more work, and like I said, you can bring quite a few training path, like project units to Path of Radiance and be completely fine. You could probably even LTC the game while giving a bunch of bonus experience to uh, someone like Nephany and still get within like 5 or 10 of the lowest turn count if you do the right strategies. So it doesn't impede you a whole lot. Uh, it mostly just means that she's in incompatible with a lot of audience that need a lot of bonus experience like Astrid, Makalov, Tormod. Uh, units like that, basically, and I think that is a limiting factor. In FE10, she's a bit more self-sufficient. She can train herself a little bit in her exclusive Part 2 chapters. And in Part 3, she's kind of like a budget version of Mia, I think, where you want to give her a forged uh, lance with some crit on it, maybe. Give her a depth and uh, have her raise herself. Her stats are going to be a little bit worse. She's not going to be doubling Swordmasters right away. But you have plenty of room and plenty of bonus experience to make her good in, in Radiant Dawn. And she'll probably promote around the same time, given roughly the same amount of favoritism as everyone else. And that's pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get the Wishblade until like all the way near the end of the game, which I think is what makes Nephany really good, is having the ability to have 1-2 range to kill everything. And until then, she kind of has to do with like kill lances or forged steel lances, but she's still fine. And she probably promotes like around 
311 for me most of the time, which is the time that most units promote. So she's not that far behind. She just takes a little bit of extra work, which I think is a I think that's more better for her, more better for her than uh, what she does in, in Path of Radiance. So I would say that Nephany is a small improvement. Um, if you have transfers Nephany, then she's a completely different unit than Radiant Dawn. She's way stronger, and you could argue her up to big improve. Uh, also, if you're playing normal mode, then Nephany's value absolutely skyrockets because you have way more bonus experience to work with. Uh, you can give her a bunch of bonus experience in the two end game base and kind of turn her into like a Sentinel if you want to. But that strategy doesn't work on hard mode. So uh, I wouldn't recommend that or trying that on hard mode. But it is a pretty cool thing that pretty much only she can do. Uh, Brom, similar start to Nephany in Radiant Dawn. Uh, by similar, I mean like he's kind of okay in, in part two and then in part three, he just kind of falls off. Whereas, whereas I think it's like better long term prospects, Brom doesn't really. Um, FE9, like I said about Gatry, I think there is value to like a, having a big tanky general in maniac mode, but in hard mode, I'm not so sure. Uh, but technically, the night ward exists, you can give him a bunch of speed level ups and he might get to double eventually. And like I said, you do have mounted units that can carry one foot unit around if you think they're worth doing. That with. I don't think Braum is worth that, but it is something that you can do and you can use Braum without getting in your own way a whole lot. Like, he can train himself because he is so bulky. It just takes a long while. I've never really trained him full time in either game. Actually, that's a lie. I used him in my uh, Radiant Dawn Iron Man, and I think I got him killed by a hammer at some point. Uh, might be. He has a water affinity, which is really good for everyone he supports. It's really nice. Uh, I think he's better off in Path of Radiance because it's easier to get away with utilizing him there. Uh, whereas in Raining Dawn, it, I think you get less value out of it and it is a bit harder to do, which is the opposite of what happens with Nephany somehow, but that is the vibe I get. Uh, either way, I don't think he's very good in either game, so I would probably put him in about the same. Uh, he's a fun training project for sure, but I don't think he stands out beyond like his part 2 joining chapter basically in uh, Raining Dawn. Zeharg, uh, somehow a big improvement. You'd think that Binding Blade is the best Swordmasters, but uh, actually I feel like Zeharg is one of the best Swordmasters in the game in the in the series, in Radiant Dawn. In Path of Radiance, there was like a lot of people arguing Zeharg versus Mia, and the answer to that question is pretty much just whoever you prefer. Uh, I think Zeharg is significantly better, but some people think it's important that you're around for longer and that you can train her up to be way better than when Zeharg joins, and I guess that is one perspective you can have. Uh, I think Innate Adept is better than Innate Vantage, and Zeharg's bases and not having to be trained for the time that Mia is around, I think is better. And uh, generally, there's not a whole lot of places in Path of Radiance where having a fast sword user is something that you need for anything specific. He doesn't join fast enough to double faster enemies like enemy Myrmidons. Actually, he might double those, but not enemy Ravens. I remember from the top of my head trying to use him, he did not double Ravens right away, and it takes a lot to get him to that point. And then even when you do, Ravens are not hard enough to deal with to like just... Usually you need two units to deal with them anyway. And so there's not that much value to having someone who can be specialized against just them. And against almost every other type, Zeharg is generally worse off. Uh, even enemy axe users, when you use a hand axe, Zeharg doesn't have much of a response. Uh, the Sonic Sword is not a response and you don't have enough of those for it to be really worth it. And there's not much else that... A Swordmaster can really do in Path of Radiance that stand out. Uh, he's fine. It's just that whenever there's like an enemy group that you can safely put Zyrk against, there's probably someone else in your army who does the job better. And that is okay. Uh, but generally, I don't think there's a reason to bring him along. Uh, even among foot units, I think the ones that have access to 1 2 range and more bulk and more strength and better weapon types are just better off. Radiant Dawn Zyrk, completely different person. Uh, Pre promotes that joins way ahead of the pack. Uh, doubles everything, has a killing edge that few other people can use, innate adept that you can take off, but why would you? Uh, you can give him, I think you can give him vantage almost right away. He's just so, so good at killing things. He even gets a wind edge. And the wind edge at FE10 isn't very good, but it's still a substantial improvement over not having any good 1 to 2 range at all. And in part 1 at least, it makes it, he makes it work. And just in general, Zeharg with an Earth support is a good avoid tank in FE10 that can get through pretty much the entire game with little issues. He's a little worse in part 4 than he is in part 3, but overall he's a good unit. So I would say he's a, he's a big improvement over his mediocre self in Path of Radiance. Uh, so just like Volk, just completely changes roles. Uh, possibly one of the biggest improvements on the tier list so far, because in FE9 he is just 
statistically the worst thief. If you're really strictly only using him for thieving, he's probably better than Volk just because he doesn't cost a little bit of gold. Although you have to subtract the value from a couple chapters from him uh, because he joins a little bit later than Volk does. I usually just use both in a lot of treasure chapters. But Nephi 10, he is one of the best units in the game. It used to be that people just considered Ike and Har the best units by far, and so it would be like several tiers below. But now I think most people proficient in FE10 will realize, okay, Soth is almost as good as Ike is. He is easily the best unit you have for the Order Dawn Brigade. And even while other units join that are statistically just as strong, the fact that he has access to Forged Knives and Pekaya support, plus the few chapters where he said he's just the strongest units by so much, he is just so, so good. He is insane, Rainy Dawn. Uh, so... I already talked pretty elaborately about how like mediocre thieving is in FE9, but how it's still like sort of valuable. So so it is pretty mid to bad in that game, but in FE10 he is by far the biggest improvement. Uh, very funny that Soth has a transfer system that works differently from everyone else. If you give Soth a uh, a transfer, if you get him to level 20, he just copies over his FE9 sets to FE10. And if you're playing 0% growth, then you can get like the most awful Soth possible and just really nerf your Dawn Brigade into the grounds. Do not recommend, but it makes for very funny screenshots. Jill is very interesting because in both games she is a training project unit but in both games she's also considered very good i have been more hype on both versions of jill in the past than i am right now i'm noticing in fe9 that she has a bit more speed issues than i thought she did and fe10 uh I, I never had a problem with her requiring some favoritism to get going but honestly even with the favoritism I'm finding that it's still a little hard in hard mode to get her uh, to tier 3 in a timely fashion and she still falls behind a little bit in part 4. She still isn't one running at that point. So she's definitely got some issues. I still really like her as a unit and I like using her. Uh, I just don't think she's like top top tier anymore. And I've seen some people argue that for example FE10 Seahark is better than FE10 Jill which is what we would consider wild uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that said she's still in the upper echelon in both games. And I would say the FE9 version is better just because bonus experience is easier to get her patched up with in FE9 than it is in FE10. If you were to bonus experience Jill in FE10, she would get awfully like strength screwed. And you also just don't have enough to get her going in the first place, in even in a normal mode, honestly. It's not a great idea to just bex Jill right away. Uh, you want to like raise her the hard way, and then once she has kept some stats, then you give her some bonus experience. And it, doesn't tend to work for very long. It tends to be very late into tier 1 and tier 2 where she caps some stats. Uh, maybe tier 2 is okay, but tier 1 she definitely doesn't cap a lot of things to make for like a great bonus experience candidate like Mia is in tier 2, for example. And then in Path of Rain's Jill, she does need some more speed than she has, but even if you don't give it to her, it's still just good to have a high strength, high HP flyer with occasionally enough speed to double things. And speed wings do exist to patch that issue up a little bit. Uh, or you can, if you're playing like fixed mode, uh, new game plus with all the bands, you can give her a speed band that will help a little bit too. There's ways to patch up that speed and make her really good really fast. Even if without a massive bonus experience dump, Jill is still more usable than FE9. So I would say FE9 Jill is significantly better. I don't know if it's like a big nerf because she's still good in both games. I don't think she got nerfed as much as like the mages and Marsha and Kieran did. So I don't put her in, in small nerf. I think that is reasonable. And that's probably one of the few examples of a unit that's like good in Radiant Dawn that still got nerfed. I guess Satania is in here too. Um, that's probably the best next best candidate. I don't know why this game hates redheads this much. Uh, Astrid. <laughs> hey. What up, Astrid? Um, hold up. Let me get you a special tier just for you. <laughs> She's so bad in Radiant Dawn and so nice in um, Path of Radiance. It's really unbelievable what they did to her, and a lot of people hate it, uh, both character and gameplay-wise. Uh, Astrid in FE9 joins with Paragon, and in a chapter where you can get a bunch of Ravens for easy experience, you still have to set them up for her because her damage, despite the effective damage, is still awful. And uh, But she grows so, so fast, and you get bonus experience and a Night War to patch up her speed. And Paragon works with bonus experience. She just grows so, so fast that it's really not unreasonable to have Astrid grow like nine levels between her joining time and the next chapter after the base. And without that much favoritism. Uh, easily one of the best growth units in the series. Still has some issues where like her durability isn't the great even the greatest even after like uh, a couple levels her strength still needs some work uh you might need to give her like a forced steel act after promotion but fortunately 
if you choose axes after promotion, you get E-rank axes, I think, but you can use four steel axes anyway because steel axes are E-rank for some reason. It's really nice. And then she's just kind of good from there, and she probably has a claim to all your good bows because not many people are going to train roll for Shinon, especially if they're planning to use Astrid. Why would you introduce competition over, like, the Brave Bow when you can just have one of them use the Brave Bow and the other one sit on the bench? So Astrid is really nice. There are some late game chapters where being a Paladin is not that great and Astrid misses a lot of the early chapters where being a Paladin is really great. And so you're stuck with like swamp maps and there's the desert map that she's around for and the mountain map, you know, the Eat Rock one. Where Astrid unfortunately cannot do a whole lot and that kind of cuts into the amount of the chapters she can read for. But overall, I would still say she's like a B or A tier unit. She's pretty good. And then Radiant Dawn says, all right, take all the issues the Crimean Royal Knights have, take all the issues that uh, foot locked or rather ground locked mount units have and on top of that get like awful 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 base stats paragon is no longer yours exclusively and it doesn't work with bonus experience anymore and you don't even want bonus experience anymore because it'll just screw up the stats that you don't have high growth in and you just get an awful unit with awful availability awful stats and not the greatest class ever still fun to make it to a good unit by part four but it is so much more work than any other unit in this game or indeed path of radiance astrid so yeah uh probably the biggest nerf that we've seen so far you could probably justify her being a big nerf so far but i wanted to have a lot here so sue me next is makalov and makalov is like Kind of like Astrid in a lot of ways. Uh, it doesn't get nerfed as hard, but it still kind of gets screwed by Radiant Dawn existing. Same issues with Crimean Royal Knights and everything. Path of Radiance Makalov joins less underleveled, but also has no Paragon. And it uses swords instead of bows, which is not that much worse, but it's kind of annoying still. Still probably needs axes after promotion to get reasonable attacking power. He is like, okay, once you train him, he's still a good paladin. Uh, he has like reasonably good growth, so he'll become good. Uh, it's just not as interesting, and he's not a girl like Astrid, so a lot of people just don't like him. Uh, and then in Radiant Dawn, he has all the Crimean Royal Knights issues that I've went over, in addition to just not being very good intrinsically enough himself. He doesn't have access like Kieran does. Um, I think he gets access after promotion, after Tier 3, but getting him there is a bit of a pain, and there's not much to it, sort of return to it. So I would say this is a small nerf. Uh, the bigger nerf is that he, he helps make Astrid worse by existing. Uh, Torgod is another one of those growth units in uh, FE9. We're really hitting a lot of them right now. Uh, he does require a fair bit of bonus experience more than someone like Astrid because of the lack of Paragon. He has a special niche in return where he has Celerity, a skill that no one else can have in that game. And it's it's a really good skill to have. It's nice to have a mobile mage that can also use like long range tomes and uh, maybe even status stabs if you raise his staff rank a lot. But that's a lot of work for Torbot. I would recommend just sticking to tomes mostly. You get a similar return to like Sword and Ileana, but quite a bit later into the game because while Sword and Ileana require a lot of work, at least they join early enough to where they have time to put that work in, whereas Tormod really just needs a bunch of bonus experience. There's no other way to catch him up fast enough to get him going. Now, Celerity is quite a fun return to have on that, uh, but I have noticed even after training him that he does have like bulk issues and it, it just takes a lot of effort, but it's like... It's still, as long as you're not using Rolf and Nephany and who else is like a training project here and like Soren and Ileana and Marsha and Jill, as long as you're not using too many of those units, you have room to train Tormod. So as long as you can reserve that favoritism for him, he works just fine. If he 10, the guys is not around enough. He is really good in part one for when he is around, but it's only three chapters. He's great. He works all fine, or like fine, but... If you want to get into work in part four, and again, he rejoins so late that you get very little return out of it. But if you want to make it work, that takes even more favoritism than you did in Path of Radiance. And he's not very good there. But I'll give him credit where it's due. The chapters where he is around in part one, he is really good for free. And so I usually put him like around the middle of a tier list. And it's kind of the same spot for FE9 Tormod. Um, I also think he's like kind of mid in that game. He's not bad enough to be like in the lower tiers. But he just needs more work than others, but he's not so bad that you cannot put in that work ever. So, about the same, small nerf. Depends on how you look at this, his, his um, free availability. But I honestly think he's good in a different way in both games. So I'll put him in about the same. Even though they really did screw over by making him available so late. But the fact that they made him good for a couple chapters, I think, is better than in FE9 in some ways. Marum is, well, on FE10, it's kind of the same thing as Tormod, so that'll be a quick and easy section. 
Uh, FB9, he joins with probably better stats than someone of like Mordecai without requiring any training whatsoever. Uh, he joins with the Demi Band, which means that by the time you have him, you have that too. And so you don't have to deal with his transformation gauge, but you do have that opportunity cost where if you don't have Morum, you could just give the, uh, the Demi Bands to Mordecai and it will probably be roughly the same. Morum is a bit faster, so he doubles a fair amount of more enemies. He still has good strength. Uh, you can give him the smite scroll once you get it. Uh, there's going to be a while where Mordecai has smite and, and Morum doesn't. Generally, you don't need that many Lagoos fielded. You probably have other deployment slots, but the more the more units you're training, the less room you have for like filler Lagoos like Leith and Mordecai and Morum. If you're going to field only one, though, you're probably going to use Morum because he likely has the best stats out of all of them. And so he's pretty good in, in Path of Ranges for being a, a filler with decent combat. As the game goes on, you're going to need two range a lot more. You're going to need like really good stats. And Marm doesn't even have stats that are so much better than everyone else that he is a good field. So there will probably be a point where you no longer really feel like fielding him. For, for the most part, he's a good filler for a while. So yeah, I would say he's about as good as Lethe and Mordecai in um, Path of Radiance. He, he joins a little later, but his stats are a bit better. And then in Radiant Dawn, about the same as Tormod, like good for a while, but it's only a short while, unfortunately. And just like Tormod, it takes a lot to get him going. Probably easier because his raw stats are a bit better. You just have to mind his gauge. But if you want to, you give him like a Lagoose gem. <laughs> and he probably will be right. Um, so I would say he's better than Tormod in Path of Radiance. And probably better in Rainy Dawn as well. So it kind of cancels out. So about the same? Question mark? Uh, Stefan, really weird this one. Uh, another unit that's barely around in Radiant Dawn and then around quite a bit in Path of Radiance. I think he is the is he the only promote you get after Titania, not counting like Lagoos. I guess Shinon, but other than that, it's not a whole lot of them around, is there? And then he is just so high level and his stats are so, so good at base. I still find him a little unimpressive for how good his stats are just because of how annoying it is to only have one range on your swords and not have a mount. Um, and then this works, like, if you're gonna be an unmounted unit, I, you better be, like, a 1-2 range god that murders everything, like Soren or Void can be, with enough favoritism, whereas Stefan can never get to that level, but I'll admit the stats are good. The fake Kadi, no one else can use it for a while, so he gets credit for being able to use that. Um, Astra is, an, is his skill, I guess. It's uh, It sucks when it depletes my fight Kadi uses, but eh, it's still generally better when it activates than that it doesn't activate ever. So, I don't know, I think he's good enough in Path of Radiance, but I never really used him long term. Uh, I usually feel him like the Strange Forest arc at some point, and that's about it. Uh, he's good, like, I don't know, B or C tier or something. Whereas in Rainy Dawn, again, he hardly exists, and not existing kind of sucks when you're good at fighting, which he is. Uh, he joins in the desert chapter, but he's likely going to be one of the last people, things you find in the desert. Uh, just getting Mikaya over there takes a lot of time, and then he's around for endgame only. Like I said, for Volk. That doesn't mean a whole lot. So I would say the guy got nerfed by not being around. So I'm going to throw him in big nerf, small nerf, big nerf. One of the nerfs for sure. Uh, I would say not being around at all is a pretty big nerf. <laughs> uh, Dev Don, I'm going to pretend that he's the same person as Dunvet for the purposes of this video. Uh, he joins like around the same time as Steve Ann in Path of Radiance. That's why they're next to each other on this tier list thing. And... I mean, my, my Maniac playthrough just now, I killed him, so I didn't really have any chance to have any good impressions on him. Uh, from what I remember, his stats are pretty mediocre. You can make him work with enough favoritism, but it takes a lot of night work level ups, and when you're pre promoted, you don't get a whole lot of those. I do like the Master Skill Luna that Halberd Gears get in this game. I didn't mention it for Nefity because she doesn't really have the chance to, like, she doesn't really have the capacity to put it on when you have, want to have Wrath and Likely Vantage. Uh, but Luna, I mean, Dunvet is not going to keep Serenity, is he? So Luna's okay, it actually adds damage that he might need. Uh, so a reasonable candidate to like put that on. And then just kind of mediocre stats overall. Not really worth raising, but a funny project that you can make work if you want to. It's just more fun to use someone like Tormod or Astrid or Makalov, I think. And then uh, Radiant Dawn, pretty similar deal, honestly, but with all the issues that the Crimean Road Knights have. He does have the cool advantage of not being mounted, so all the mounted units in that squad can carry him around and drop him somewhere if you want to. And he can like climb the ledges in 3-9 and do some things that the multi units probably don't want to or cannot do. And then when he rejoins with the with the Grim Mercenaries and the rest of the army, he stands out in a negative way because his stats are definitely below what you would have at that point. If you raised someone like Nefany and compared her stats, she's gonna be just way better. And that goes for almost everyone in your armor too. So 
I would say at that point you probably don't really find him that impressive, Donvet, but uh, he's alright. Uh, you could definitely do worse. Uh, he's pretty bad, like below average in both games, so I'd say he's about the same. Uh, Tanith, I'm thinking that's a nerf. Uh, Path of Rains Tanith joins reasonably late in the game, but even though it's like chapter 18 that she joins, there's still a lot of games to go, or a lot of game to go, because a lot of the maps that are after that are longer than you would usually, uh, like usually longer than the early game maps last. Like 17 is a very long map, but before that, most of the maps are shorter than the maps that come after 17. So there's enough for her to make a good impression. She has an Earth Affinity that she can build up, although chances are someone like Oscar will have full support by the time Tanith joins, so maybe that won't be a whole lot for her. Uh, one fun issue I have with Tanith is that you do have the full guard to protect her against arrows, but you likely also have either Marsha or Jill. <laughs> and at that point, you kind of need to give it to Tanith if you want her to get exposed to bows, because otherwise she just freaking dies, where someone like Jill could survive. But even though Jill has good defenses, and even though bows only have double might against flyers, she's still really going to feel the difference between having the full guard and not having it. So. Create, having extra flyers creates an issue that otherwise wouldn't be there. That said, flying utility is nice. Reinforces a really good skill. It makes the game take a bit longer, but also it's really funny to watch the NPCs destroy things or get destroyed or unexpectedly come out on top against enemies. I've had one of my units get saved by uh, the, one of the NPC Falcon Knights critting, which is really funny. Uh, it's good to have. Uh, a maniac mode, especially the Falcon Knight that she reinforces, is very, very strong. It's like capped strength and speed or something ridiculous like that. Uh, but they're still really nice to have in English Maniac. And just in general, Tanit is a good combat unit herself. Uh, she has high rank lances and sword. She keeps the Sonic Sword, and she, I think, one rounds Wyverns right away. I'm not sure if you want to use it that early to use it, but it is a nice emergency option to get rid of a Wyvern that got into your camp. Uh, generally speaking, I don't think she's able to one out everything around her, but her base performance is definitely better than some of the more unleveled units. She's not on par with the trained units you have, but she's not as bad as some of the unleveled units you have. And she can be made good if you if you want her to be, uh, with a little bit of favoritism. She's a good target for like stat boosters that you just don't have a good purpose for at that point. You're like, well, I want to give out this energy job and this speed wing and this energetic grow, but I just don't know who to give it to. Tanith is usually able to convert them into something useful because she doubles. She has enough bulk to survive, but not quite to survive everything. So that's what I usually use them for if I'm planning to use Tanith. She's really nice. F10, she joins a bit too late. Not as late as someone like Stefan or uh, like uh, the, the rejoining of Tormod and, uh, and Warm. Uh, but still, 3.11 is around the time. It's the same time as Ike gets Ragnell, so <laughs> stiff competition there. Of course, it's hard to compare to Ike, but even other units are usually going to be stronger than Tanith is. It's still nice to have a flyer just to be able to fly across pitfalls and then fly across... Um, the desert in the Micaiah part of part 4, and there's usually something for her to do. She's not force deployed like Sigrun is, so her spots are not free, but if you're only using like a small group of units, which is usually recommended for hard mode, then there's probably going to be some space for Tanith to do her thing. She joins close to tier 3 promotion, so it doesn't take much to get her there, but still some dedication. That said, she does rejoin at a time where you get like the Paragons uh, from the Crimean Royal Knights. So if you have space for Tanith, you probably have space to give her Paragon as well. And with just like a Horse Slayer, it's very easy to feed her a bunch of Paladins in 311 and 313 to make her work. So definitely easy to train. Uh, the return isn't as big. Like I said about Marsha, the Falcon Knights in this game feel a little bit undertuned, I guess is the word I would use. I think she's worse in Radiant Dawn, but still decent in both games. So I'm going to put her in small nerf. Raisin is an interesting case. In um, Path of Rains, he's the only Heron, whereas in Radiant Dawn, he is one of multiple Herons. I don't. I, I had like a whole segment in Don Don's 3 5 video about why Raisin is worse than Leanne and Raphael. And it kind of comes down to the fact that if you're just Vigoring on turn one, then the other Herons are better. And usually, turn one Vigor is the most important thing for Herons to do. So that makes Raisin worse intrinsically. Now, if he gets to transform, then obviously he's better, but it's rarely useful in an LTC context to make that happen. That said, this isn't about LTC, that's just a fun side fact. Uh, for the most part, Raisin is just a good unit in both games, and we don't really care about the comparisons to the other Herons, regardless, because they're not on this list. Unfortunately, they're not present in uh, Path of Raisin. It's not as playable units anyway. Uh, but I just thought that was a fun side tension to mention. Uh, one of the most broken units in FE9, for sure, once you have him. I usually don't put him all the way at the top of a tier list because he's not around for all of them, but once he is there, the ability to figure four units at a time is great. 
I don't usually Lagoon Stone him on turn one just because you don't have enough Lagoon Stones to do that all the time, and I have a bit of a hoarding problem sometimes. Uh, but there are chapters where I'll say, okay, we're going to use the Lagoon Stone turn one. It's funny because if a chapter, it's kind of like with Leith and the other Lagoons. Um, if you want to have him transform during a chapter, you probably want to see how long you think the chapter is going to last because. If you don't give him a Lagoon Stone, he will probably transform anyway on like turn 5. So if you're still in the middle of things at that point, then why not wait and just save yourself a Lagoon Stone use? So the chapter lasts like 10 turns, then you probably are okay with him transforming on turn 5 and just using a turn 1 Vinger instead of using a Lagoon Stone. Uh, but if a chapter only has 5 turns, then you want to transform him right away and start using those 4-way uh, dances right away. And again, if the chapter lasts like 15 turns, uh, then he's going to have like five turns of I'm not transforming and turn five transform and then five turns of being transformed I think and then after that he's gonna transform again these numbers might not be accurate but I hope you get the point I'm trying to make here is that you know you don't always need to Lugu stone to get the maximum amount of transformation turns out of raisin and uh, that's really interesting to think about usually if I'm just like playing by ear not really thinking about it then you don't really need to use Lugu stone because the chapter is gonna last beyond turn five you'll get your value anyway and turn, like, 4-way Vigor is insane in both FB9 and FB10 because you have so many good units that can move into position after attacking, thanks to Kanto. Um, in Path of Radiance, you have all these Paladins and Flyers, and in Radiant Dawn, you also have the Hawk Lagoos that really appreciate having some extra turns. So it's really easy to get a good value out of it. And even if you don't, even if you use Untransformed Raisin, just having a Dancer is obviously great. So Raisin is near the top of every tier list in both games. Uh, I do think the FE9 version is better just because it feels like he's around a little bit more, uh, comparatively speaking, because he joins around the, the same time as Tanit does, so there's like 10-ish well, like chapters remaining for that point. Uh, whereas for Radiant Dawn, he's around for 3-5, and 3-7 is kind of like a whatever chapter to be around for, but I'm sure there's a chapter like that in Path of Radiance, so whatever, we'll count as a chapter. So you got 3-5, 3-7, 3-8, um, 3 9 no, 3 10. Uh, 3 10 is around. Um, and then I'm, I'm counting on my fingers, you can't see it. 3 10. Um, 3 11 he doesn't exist because Leanne uh, replaces him for there. So 3 11 and then 3 12, 3 13 is all um, Dom Brigade. So you got 3 E. That's five chapters, and then you got, a, you got end game. And he's not the best hero for end game, so I'm not going to count like. Um, the actual endgame chapters for him, although I guess he exists for them, so sure. That's like four maps, so that's like nine maps total out of a really massive game, so... I guess not all those maps are Grand Mercenaries, but it just feels like he's around less. So, you could say small nerfs, but it's probably kind of close. I'm going to put him like about the same, because he really does function about the same as in both games. I changed my mind a little bit. About the same. Uh, Yanov and Oki... Um, I don't use these units in Path of Rains enough to have a great opinion about them. I ask other people about them every time I discuss them in like my tier list and my um, my discussions with Raisins when we're doing the Let's Play. Uh, I don't need enough in Path of Radiance. Transforms right away, with just like Leith, which is good. Uh, but his stats are still not like great enough to be really outstanding. And the same goes for Oki, except he doesn't have the transformation gauge. So they're both pretty mid to bad in Path of Radiance. Worse than other units you have trained at that point. And then they have like those issues. Not being transformed for a portion of the map is bad. Uh, not having two range is bad. I have to worry about gauge when they exist is not great. Path in Rainy Dawn, though, obviously they get massive, massive buffs. We're going to talk at length about how good they are in the FE10 0% growth run. Uh, when Dunnan gets back to uploading those, we have recorded 3-7, which is a lot of Hawk praise. The long and short is that, think of like a Grim Mercenary, any Grim Mercenary, uh, think of like what their best stat is, and Yanov and Oki probably beat it. Uh, they're faster than Mia, they're bulkier than Har, um, they are stronger than Ike, they also fly, and then they have Kanto on top of that. It's just ridiculous how strong they are in Raining Dawn. They couldn't have nerfed the unit, or they couldn't have buffed the unit more in Raining Dawn if they tried. <laughs> uh, they don't exist for the entire game, obviously, but when they do exist, they're just so, so, so good. And managing Gage is a little bit annoying for them, uh, but fortunately they join around at the same time as Race, and which makes it a lot easier. So, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about this. They, they use favoritism in a fantastic way too, like stat boosters count double on the goose generally, like uh, energy drops. They don't need speed wings, but energy drops are really the big ones. Uh, they can take the adept scroll and just kill everything that they already 3 at KO. Uh, they can use bonus experience to get to level 30 and then get tear if you want to. 
or if you want the best long-term prospects, you just don't give them those skills. Instead, raise their strike rank as much as you can, and then they will double for five extra damage per hit. So like ten damage if they get the S strike, and I think it's like plus eight if they get the S strike, or it's plus five again. I forgot. It's a lot of damage. They murder everything. Uh, fantastic units of Rainy Dawn, whereas really mid in Path of Rain. So I think. They don't often come up in discussions between units that got buffed between Radiant Dawn and uh, Path of Radiance, but uh, I think they're really prior examples. Uh, Khalil barely exists in both games. I would say her utility in Path of Radiance stands out a little bit more as a unit that can use like long-range magic and stuff. She can do it in Radiant Dawn too, but it's really less useful there. Radiant Dawn has a lot more route maps late game, where such things don't really matter as much, I think. Whereas Path of Radiance is like... A, is like the, the priest map, where it's kind of, kind of nice and just uh, more like hallway chapters. I don't know. She feels a bit better in Path of Rains than in Rainy Dawn. Uh, also, sages just generally are worse off for reasons mentioned in like Sorns and Ileana's entries. Like just higher enemy resistance. Uh, they have a harder time doubling because for some reason all the sages are slow as hell and Khalil is not that fast. So I'm going to hit her with a small nerf. Or rather, the game did. It's not my fault. Don't blame me for this. Uh, Toroneo, another interesting entry. Path of Radiance, he joins, I would say, a little bit too late to be useful. And even when he does join, he's pretty mid. Uh, Resolve is fun to activate. If he gets a low half HP, he has like a bunch of extra strength and speed. Uh, it is a little bit harder to keep him alive at that point. His defense is good, but not so good at takes zero damage. And magic is a bit of a problem. But it is fun. It's it's alright. It's fine. And then you have to like rescue drop him around, obviously, because most people are going to beat him through the front lines. But if he can get there, he's all right. And he can be self-sufficient. He can be like a guy that runs up to a single enemy and just bonks him over a couple turns. Uh, it's all right, but it's nothing special. Uh, like a pretty lower mid kind of unit. Whereas Radiant Dawn, oh my god. Um, for 1-6, the only chapter he's around for, uh, the only chapter pair, I guess he's around for in part one, he just destroys everything because he's overleveled as hell. And in part three, he, he usually isn't going to destroy everything for you if you're just playing the game blind. Uh, but uh, efficiency slash LTC players have figured out that you can favor Toronio in Dawn Brigade over like Nolan and Jill. And he does have the ability to destroy everything in like 3-12 and 3-13. And it actually works out that you don't get punished for this in the long term because you don't need uh, someone like Nolan to be super useful in the long term. So you can do that. Uh, you probably prefer to have something like the Boots or Speed Wings to be on Jill if you're using her. And I imagine that she's useful, but the fact that you can do it is kind of funny, I think. It's a, another fun part of like how creative LTC players can be. Uh, generally speaking, though, Torneo is still useful in Part 3. Uh, if you're holding the line in 313 or if you're just slowly chugging through enemies in 312, um, like standing on a ledge in a, special, in a special starting position on the left side of that chapter where you can like push the rocks down, um, it's pretty useful. Torneo has a lot of chapters in that game where he's just good to have around, regardless of how much you actually want to train him. And even in part 4, I would say at worst he's as useful as he is in Path of Radiance. Like, just one more guy he can throw with enemies, that's probably going to be fine. There might be some enemies that double him, and he might not always win 1v1s, but with concoctions and good enough weaponry, he can definitely get there. So, uh, I don't know if it's a big improve, I would say it's a small improve. I'm going to hit him with a small improve. I don't think he's as improved as, like, Ulki and Yanov, but he's definitely better in Radiant Dawn than he is in Path of Radiance. Uh, Ranulf is really mid in both, so I'm probably going to end up putting him in about the same, but he's like that unit I never really use, because I never really want to use him. In Path of Radiance, he joins, first of all, all these units just join too late to do a whole lot, so if they are like substantially useful at all in the game, then they're going to be, uh, they're going to get a small improve or a big improve. And Ranulf is just kind of okay in Path of Radiance when he joins, it's, it's like an upgraded version again of Morim and Mordecai, I think. I believe he has the, the con or the weight to shove some people that lighter people can't. Uh, but he's still a cat. He still doesn't hit very hard. He's still just kind of okay, I guess. And in, in Radiant Dawn, he's around a lot more. He's force deployed for the entirety of part three. And his stats are fine, but the cat gauge in Radiant Dawn is just so freaking awful to deal with that it kind of negates everything that is good about him. Uh, the way Donald explained it, I'm name dropping him a lot here, but it's on my mind right now. The way he explained it in 3-4 is that Renolf loses like one extra gauge for every single action. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you only have 30 gauge total and when you get attacked like three to four times every turn it adds up just so fast and he just loses gauge so much quicker that if you only had to manage olivia grass and nothing else that'd be one thing but sometimes you want to attack with the guy and sometimes he wants to heal as well sometimes you just get hit by a mage you want to heal so managing hp and gauge at the same time is a challenge for Renolf if you want to use him as more than just a filler unit and that's usually what i do is just have him like 
grass up when he's not doing anything, maybe smite a couple guys or like rescue drop race in somewhere. And at some point, fight like one or two guys. But you got to be careful with him because he is a game over condition. Uh, I'm not going to use that to distract from his rating, for like detract from his rating, but he's all right. I'm going to throw him in about the same. Even though he feels very different in availability, uh, he has some of the same issues and he doesn't feel substantially better in one game or the other. Uh, Har, excuse me while I get another tier up here. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, he's so good. I don't know why they decided to pick him out of all units they could have improved, but they did. R is insane. Um, in Path of Radiance, I like him. I think he's good. He just isn't around enough, and he doesn't have enough speed to double everything. But he, he doubles some things. It's all right. It's nice how he how clutch he can be sometimes in that game. But on Radiant Dawn, if you don't give him any favoritism, he's your best unit because he's just like tanky and weakening enemies for your units to kill and. The mobility alone gets him there, but if you do give him favoritism, like just a speed wing and some bonus experience and maybe a master crown, bro just destroys half the game. Like the easiest way to play the game is just to use Har and everyone else just cleans up after him. <laughs> he's so busted. I'm sure I don't need you guys to tell me this. Uh, he has some weaknesses, but they can all be patched up. Like he's weak to thunder magic, but nullify kind of negates it uh, or having fortune kind of negates it. Uh, he can kill a mage before they attack him if he uses the brave lance or the brave axe. Uh, he can just... He's so flexible, he can stay out of the range. He can survive one anyway because he's just that, he's just got that much HP. Uh, his speed is close enough to doubling that you can get him there if you want him to. Uh, but even if you don't, he's just so, so disgustingly good. And he just never dies. Bro has like 15,000 defense. He's so stupidly good. And he can also help you get other units activated. He can rescue drop Ike somewhere or Mia or whoever you happen to be favoring at that point. Gatri also can be ferried forward, uh, solve his mobility issue. It's a really nice unit to have. <laughs> it's really cool. You could argue that some units in Big Improve could be argued as like improved as much as Har, because uh, Har wasn't bad in Path of Radiance, and he Har also has some weaknesses in Radiant Dawn, uh, some like I don't know Soth or you know for Alki. But at the same time, I think Har deserves a special shout out. Uh, Bastion is again not around enough to be of meaningful impact in either game. Joins right before Endgame and Radiant Dawn, so only has like that swamp map to maybe throw a Meteor at a Laguz or maybe heal one of your units, and that's it. And then in Path of Radiance, uh, you can do some meme strats with Corrosion. Uh, Kirby Massa told me that in FV9 speedruns, sometimes you would have Bastion Meteor an enemy with a... or a Bolting or whatever he can use. Like, you, you hit an enemy Sage with his long-range magic to deplete their long-range magic with Corrosion. Because apparently if you activate Corrosion, then the, the Sage will lose all their long-range Tome uses, and that stops them from attacking, saves some animation time, which is really cute. And uh, in Rainy Dawn, he doesn't really have anything like that, so he's kind of there until he's not, which is literally within one chapter. Um, probably slightly better in Path of Radiance, maybe, but it's really splitting hairs. So I'm going to put him about the same, because yeah, I, I, I never use him in either. Uh, same ish thing for Lucia. Uh, she is really good in that one chapter in Radiant Dawn, uh, where she is the main lord and she's just way over leveled compared to everything else. She still isn't killing everything in one round there unless she uses the Silver Sword, but she still doesn't like counter everything and kill everything with the Wind Edge. So, could still do with an improvement there, but it's definitely better than her non existence and complete mediocrity in Path of Radiance. So. I'm going to give her the small improve for having one chapter where she's really good. And then she's still usable in part four. You can, like, crown her and be okay, I guess. But it's really just about the one chapter where she's really good. Uh, Joffrey, uh, again, we're, since we're going by recruitment order in Path of Radiance, I'm going to say this a lot, but this unit isn't around enough to be really impactful in Path of Radiance. He is really good when he is around. It's nice to have a guy you can just slap the Night Ward on. Or does he already have one? He, I feel like he already has one. You get, like, two at that point. Maybe I'm wrong about that. He's nice to have. He has Paragon, so you can grow him a bunch of speed if he needs more. He usually doesn't. He's fine. Um, just a good class. Having lances and bows is is alright. You kind of wish he had axes, but other than that, he does enough damage to be helpful. He can rescue drop people. Uh, he can work with Raisin because he's Kanto. If you don't have enough units with, uh, with that, then he can definitely help. Uh, you might not always have room for him, depending on how many he's trained. But if you have room at all, like you can just kick out your filler lagoos or whatever you're using and just use Joffrey and he's fine in Path of Radiance. It's only for like five chapters, but it's it's better than nothing. It's it's like better than what Lucia has, for sure. And then in Radiant Dawn, I mean, Bro got hit by the Crimean Royal Knights and the Paladin nerfs. And on top of that, they also just made him unavailable for late part three. Whereas every other Crimean Royal Knight, like, Dov like Donved and Kieran, 
they join up with the main army. They're not good, but at least they're around. And Joffrey just waits until like 4-5 to show up. He's not even in 4-2 in the Tibarn army. So, yeah, bro got hit with a big nerf. It's, I'm sorry, dude. It's uh, You were at least a kind of good in Path of Radiance. You could argue small nerf because he's not around enough for it to be a big nerf, but I'm going to say he got hit by a big nerf. If Kieran got hit by a big nerf, then so did Joffrey, I think. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say big nerf. Also because I don't want an extra line in this one. Uh, Largo. <laughs> wah wah. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I don't know why they didn't make him deployable. Maybe they didn't feel like having a Berserker class in Pet Ready Dawn, but uh, wah wah. Sucks, dude. Uh, Elincia is, I mean, her class is really cool in both games, like a flying uh, Pegasus Knight with stabs as opposed to a non-flying Pegasus Knight. Elincia is just very cool conceptually, but she's only there for like, is it two maps? I think it's like three maps in Path of Radiance. He joins in Clash, and then you have like 27, 28, and final. It's not a lot of maps. There's not a lot for her to do stuff. And then also there's not enough like impactful staffs for her to really do anything that other units couldn't. If you want Fortify or the, the Ashera staff or the Rescue staff, she can do those, but I never feel like they're impactful enough unless you really plan around them. I'm sure there's a couple cute turn saves you can do, but for casual play, it's generally not going to be impactful enough. And for like something like an Iron Man, you really don't want to deploy the Lichia because she causes the game over if she dies. So that's another like slight knock on her in, in Path of Radiance. And then her, of course, her stats are just bad. The Amidi is very weak. Um, so even though it's a brave weapon, she's usually better off with like a forged silver or something. Uh, really fun unit to train up in Path of Radiance, but really bad for that time of the game. It makes sense with her character, but oh my god. And Raining Dawn has a couple chapters where she's really good. Uh, her joining chapters is not like great because she only has a slim sword, but being able to heal Naluchi or Marsha or Har as they go through the enemies is nice at least. And then she has a physics staff in 2 dash endgame, and she has the upgraded Amidi to kill everything. And she's just easily the best unit there besides Har. So if you're playing that chapter out properly, then you can use her with Leanne to kill like four enemies per turn in combination and keep any other units safe. And she's probably going to be part of your, your Ludwig heist if you're looking to kill him uh, somewhere during the middle of the chapter, or you're trying to get the Draco shield from the enemy general with Heather. There's a lot of cute stuff you can do with Lindsay in that chapter. Uh, but she also just kills everything and heals your units to keep them alive. That's just good. And make like I feel like I'm using Leanne on her every single turn in, into the endgame. Then she just kind of AFKs until part 4. And in part 4, don't forget to take Mercy off of her. I will never forget people, I think it was Castle, uh, giving her a Paragon, expecting to raise her up. And it turns out that she, um, she has Mercy, so she can't kill enemies. So you have a unit that gets doubled experience but can't kill enemies. It's, it's adorable. Um, yeah. Still a good growth unit in that game. Uh, you can just have her staff spam if you don't if you're not interested in growing her up. But if you are, then you can give her bonus experience and kill favoritism and paragon and just have a really fun unit to use in end game that can use stabs as well as the immediate to kill things. Pretty nice. Not the best unit, but kinda good. Uh, I'm gonna give this one the big approve. Um, I think I'm feeling generous here. She's not the best unit ever in Raining Dawn, but the part where she's the best unit by far in one chapter. But on top of that, she's also like a reasonably good long-term prospect. I feel like that's a big improvement. Big enough. Uh, but you, I can see small improve. Uh, Nasir. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to do the dragons together. In, in Path of Rains, they're basically a function of the same unit. Uh, the difference is just how they are recruited. Nasir is pretty useless in Path of Radiance because if you get him, then your Ike is good enough to where you don't need him. I think I can avoid being like spoilery here. If you... If you're already spoiled on this, and you don't need me to tell you exactly how they work. But if you're not spoiled, I might as well just not tell you. So it's going to tell you the Seer is not going to be very useful for you in Path of Radiance, no matter what. Uh, whereas Anna, there's like a slight chance she'll be useful, but she's still not going to be super impactful. Radiant Dawn. Um, well, they're all free in endgame, which is like a really big plus. And that's around for a couple extra chapters, but probably not useful for more than one of them. It is nice that the enemies in her chapter just don't attack her, so you can use her freely. Uh, it's really nice against the boss in that one. So, uh, pretty big credit, even though it's a very tiny portion of Radiant Dawn. I do think it's an improvement over her near non-existence. And uh, Asir, similarly, is not very useful in one of the two chapters that he's around for, uh, but massively useful for the one that he is. So, we could probably throw both of these in small improve. I've never been in a situation where I want them in Path of Radiance, where I'm really like, making use of them. They were all right but uh, not so good. 
Uh, I think a small improvement is warranted. I want to put him in like about the same, even though the difference is very small. I do want to highlight that there is a difference. Uh, the Laguz Royals, they're all very different than Radiant Dawn, or slightly different than Radiant Dawn, uh, but pretty much the same unit in Path of Radiance. Uh, for our tier list, we had them at uh, like near the bottom because in hard mode, the circumstances under which you recruit them are they're pretty much useless. Uh, they start at the bottom of the map when every when necessarily for them to activate, you have to be near the top of the map or at least near the top of the middle, and that's just too late for them to really do anything. And even that one task that they're meant to do, they're pretty bad at compared to just having a good Ike. They're not going to save you from having a screwed Ike because of you know phase one. If you know, you know. So they were near the bottom. They were, we were like discussing whether they were worse than Rolf or not. I think that says a lot about them. They just don't exist enough. Um, and then in Radiant Dawn, Tabarn is insanely good. Uh, they're all insanely good, but Tabarn is extra good, I think, because just how powerful he is, especially compared to everyone else. I never don't use Tabarn in any playthrough. He's just that powerful. Uh, I like how he has an extra point of movement over everyone else. Uh, I like how just dominantly insane his stats are. I like how he can survive a crossbow, uh, even though he's a flyer. Uh, I like how Pavis can save him from that crossbow. Uh, just insanely, insanely powerful unit. His only limitation is no two range. Uh, so you kind of have to play around that. Uh, but sometimes there's like enemies that have two range and one range, but you can just park him next to him and he'll just suicide on him because they're stupid. And really good unit to bring to end game. You can double the last boss at base and you give him parity to do extra damage with. Uh, he kills generals in one round with like one strength proc. Uh, he's just insanely tanky and dodgy and strong. And unlike in Path of Radiance, he's actually around. Um, not for like a super long time, but enough to where I would say... I think this is a big improvement, really. Even though he's only around us for as long as like Alincia's part 4, uh, he's just so bad in Path of Radiance that I think the big improvement is warranted here. And Nasada is much of the same, different army, but same principle. Nasada doesn't have the strength to two-shot the bulk of your enemies. He only has S-Rank Strike and just a lower strength stat. But other than that, he is still just very, very good. Uh, he's forcing the route with Desert Terrain, but he's completely unimpeded by it. Uh, he has such high speed that the depth is going to proc like all the time. He has Terror, so even if an enemy is not strictly getting two-shot by him, he is still super good. So I think, honestly, he can fit in big improve as well. And uh, that probably means Gifka goes there as well. Gifka is only around for the actual end game and requires a slot, which is a bit of a nerf compared to these people that have like free utility. Uh, but he's such a good bring for end game that I think it's it's reasonable to say he's an improvement. He is by far the best pick in Path of Radiance, which might be enough for me to justify putting him in small improve because he's gonna exist most of the time, <laughs> and he's also like kind of decent at the thing he's supposed to do in Path of Radiance. Um, so I think for the sake of my overlay, I'm gonna throw him in small improve. But I will say for the record that I'm not gonna, I wouldn't mind putting him in big improve because, like I said, all these three are really just unable to do a whole lot in Path of Radiance. Uh, whereas in Radiant Dawn, they all have a niche. But the difference between Path of Radiance gift guy and Radiant Dawn gift guy is definitely smaller than Tabarn and uh, the Salas is. All right, there you go. Uh, that's the whole list. Took a bit longer than I thought it would, but here you go. Let me know if you have any counter arguments. Again, I'm sorry if I sound like I'm recovering from COVID. Um, I have no idea what I could possibly be. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this tier list. And uh, let me know in the comments what you think. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.